For all the time I've been playing around with old computers, there's one generation of hardware I've never really touched. Original Socket 7 Pentiums. And you know what? Today, I think it's time I finally fix that. And I actually have the perfect system in mind for that. And it's actually a pre-built computer that I want to start out with. The only problem is that it's a POS. Yes, a point of sale computer, and while this doesn't seem like the ideal starting point for a vintage computer build, trust me when I say by the time I'm done with this thing, it's going to be the ultimate mid to late 90s fragging monster. Through a frustrating series of events, I have acquired two of these in very different varieties. The right one is the one we will actually be building up today, and the left one is one that I acquired as part of a troubleshooting process. Now, both of these computers are actually made by the same parent company that I believe is called Safari? It's hard to tell because they're actually OEM systems integrators systems. The left one is released by Concord and the right one is by ICRDA, which is uh, International Cash Registers Distribution Association? I don't know. But they are seriously point of sale computers. They're not meant to be anything fancy and they're probably not even meant to end up in your home. Now both of these systems have the same model number, PDA2000, and are called a data book computer with the FCC ID EUN Safari Plus. And all of that information is almost useless because it's so generic, but thankfully with the Safari part of the FCC ID, I was actually able to find PDFs for how to configure this system, which is good because it wasn't set up correctly when I got it. Which is why I've never really done anything with this computer, despite getting it almost 15 years ago now. I was given this by a family member probably five years after it was retired, and it just never worked out for me. But since I was able to find that manual and now have a better understanding of how all these old systems work, I was able to get it going. And not only does it work, it works incredibly well. But there's one thing I haven't really made clear about this system. Most mid to late 90s computers are fairly large and for good reason because you need to have room to put in all the components. And if you're like me, you relish the giant cases and just can't get enough of them. But this computer isn't like that. And while most systems of this era would have been larger than something like a PlayStation, this one isn't, at least in all dimensions. Yes, this is the smallest Pentium system I have ever ever seen, and it is awesome. Now let's start to get into why this thing's so cool as I disassemble it here. Most new computers that are made small are done so using laptop parts because the chipsets are smaller and produce less heat, the components are a little bit less costly, and overall they're all just a lot smaller and easier to work with, especially when you need to integrate everything onto a single board. But that wasn't really an option around this time. So this system, aside from the CD drive and, well, sort of this power supply, uses all standard sized desktop components. That is a full size socket seven socket, although it is kind of weird and we'll take a look at that. But everything else in here is full size, including the hard drive that this originally came with. This system is designed to use a full-size 3.5 inch IDE hard drive. It's just that, well, the BIOS here kinda sucks, and the biggest sized hard drive you can use in it is 40 gigs. That wasn't a problem for this original drive that I believe is only 3 gigabytes, but when I've gone to upgrade this, that's caused me quite a number of problems. Now to get to where the hard drive goes, we have to continue on with the disassembly because in order to do almost anything with this computer, you have to take out every single component. And that whole process has made testing and troubleshooting this system a complete nightmare. Matter of fact, I've been working off and on on this computer for I think over a year now, and it has just been the most frustrating and difficult process because this motherboard is specific to this system and so are some of the cables. So this cable I actually thought had failed multiple times. 
but it turned out the original CD drive that was in this was actually bad. So that drive is new and that's why it doesn't match. Finally now, we have the motherboard in all of its glory. Now this is a very unusual motherboard. First of all, it covers the entire bottom of the case and it has a plastic film over it so that it can't short against the totally metal shield that goes over this. But it, it it's, well, it's bigger than you might think because here is a more typical Socket 7 motherboard and if I turn this one around and hold the other board up against it, you'll see the small case board is actually just a little bit bigger in all directions, which is really weird considering this one has a full complement of all of the slots that you would need, and I think maybe even two expansion slots, which is the only way that you can plug any cards into this one is with a riser over here. And this one only has two RAM slots, which I believe this originally came configured with this 32 megabyte stick, but the board maximum is 128. So I fit it with two 64 meg sticks, but this one has four memory slots <laughs> and it has two full sized IDE connectors and a floppy, which this does also have, but it only has one normal IDE. The other one is for that custom CD drive connector. But again, this one still has a lot more on it. Now, these are both boards from the time when the super IO chips like this UMC one would be integrated on board. So before you would need something like this card in say a 386 build that would give you IDE floppy and all that stuff. And it would be really handy to have that on one card, but they started integrating those types of things into the boards really fast but there is one huge difference between these two boards. This board lacks a video card, which you would need to add here. Now, what's really cool, this is an Elsa Victory 3DX, and this uses an S3 Verge DX chipset. This is a two megabyte card, optionally upgradable to four megabytes here, but this is actually the exact same chipset that's included as onboard graphics in this system. For some reason, this point of sale cash register computer has a 3D capable graphics card integrated in I think 1998 on here. That's pretty weird, but gives us some really great options. While the Verge DX does do 3D and has four megabytes of video memory, it's really better suited to 2D graphics. And because of that, it pairs great with a Voodoo 2. Yes, I'm going to be putting a Voodoo 2 inside of this computer because with that, it can handle some pretty incredible games. Now, in order to feed that Voodoo 2, I am going to have to outfit it with a processor that can really live up to the task and a Pentium 233 MMX should fit the bill. Now, what's really strange about this board and chip is that that was actually what was in it when I got it, that exact chip. This tiny little computer came with the most powerful Pentium 1 ever released. Well, at least for desktop class systems. I don't know why it was in such a weird little tiny meager computer, but it was. But the problem was it was set incorrectly. These jumpers decide what the voltage is for the processor and the voltage is actually listed on the bottom of the chip around this area and it was set to under volt it, which was causing this processor to sometimes report as a Pentium 166. That is what made it so unstable, and it took a lot of head scratching to finally figure that out, because why would a computer come with a processor and not be properly configured with it? Plus, this is, again, my first time using Socket 7 stuff, so I just didn't know to check for things like that. Next is the issue that gave me the most trouble out of anything else in this build, and it has to do with how you put the CPU in. Now, I did actually have to take the CPU out, and I was able to figure out how this socket works, but I didn't fully appreciate it when I first had to deal with it. Now, a normal socket 7 socket, you drop the processor in, it falls into the pins when you have it oriented correctly, pop it in, and drop the latch and now you're done. But there's no latch on this one. Matter of fact, there's no real strong indication 
uh, in any way of how you're supposed to secure that processor. Now, it's only because I was able to find the manual that I have any idea how this socket works, because this is just mind bogglingly stupid. You have to put a flat bladed screwdriver into a little groove here and press against the socket and the CPU to tighten it. That is how you secure it. But it gets even worse than that, because generally I've found that doesn't work well enough and you have to get in here and twist against the plastic until this side becomes totally flush and it usually takes a ridiculous amount of force and I'm actually gonna have to get my extra force applicator here because this is just stupidly tight in here. There we go. That's what it takes to install the chip in this. It, it's, it's just dumb. It had turned out the last time I'd installed this processor, I didn't fully tighten it down and it was a little loose making the system behave erratically. And then finally it came fully loose and the system just stopped booting. That's why I bought the second one because I thought I just had broken the motherboard somehow throughout all of the shenanigans I've had to go through to get this thing running. So that's why I have two of these now. But now that I know how it works after having accidentally done the same thing to the second board, but realizing my mistake, I can get this one working perfectly fine, which is good because the other one's in really bad shape. It's all rusty everywhere. Now, the next problem is thankfully one that is solved by the case manufacturer because this would not have been easy to handle on your own. A Pentium like this needs an actual active heatsink and this is where this gets tricky in this case, because if you put just a standard socket seven heatsink in there, you've now blocked all of your expansion IO. That's not going to fly. So instead, this CPU has a special low profile heatsink that hangs off of the chip onto the side. <laughs> this is just dumb. There are no heat pipes or anything in this. It's just a chunk of aluminum with a fan on one side. <laughs> so far, though, it's worked. I mean, there's no temperature probe inside the CPU that you can access, so it's hard to say if it's overheating or not. But one of the things I've done with this system is I have a power cable that allows me to just power the fan at full speed all the time. And it's my hope that that will be sufficient. All right, now let's go ahead and get that CPU cooler installed. This is kind of a challenging one because the CPU cooler itself doesn't really stay in place while you're putting it down because it wants to tip over because it's lopsided and you have to put this latch on there to hold it down. So this is going to be a two hand operation here. All righty, put it down nice and level ish get the latch on the socket there we go get it down to the other side and there we go installed i actually kind of really like this heat sink i just wish it had heat pipes or something i don't know it just feels like this fan's over here completely wasting its effort or at the very least all it's doing is cooling the 3d chip down there well 2d chip because i'm gonna have voodoo too which uh, let's take a look at installing that now because it's time to run into some more issues. All right, now this is the kind of problem I would expect more from a build like this. Now there's absolutely nothing stopping me from putting this Voodoo 2 right here in the first slot, which leaves this ISA slot open up here, which I very much wanted to use for an AW64 because it's a Pentium system with Voodoo card and AW64 would be a fantastic choice. There's just one problem. I also wanted the CD drive in the computer because I want to play the actual games I own on it. And as I slide the front of the case together, which is very difficult to do when you can't see both sides of it, the CD drive runs directly into the card in the first slot. So whatever's down here has to be a really short card if there is going to be one. And since the Voodoo 2 must now be in the top PCI slot, that means I can't use the ISA slot for a sound card. So if I want sound on this, I'm going to need a PCI sound card, which leaves me with 
pretty much one choice, a Sound Blaster Live. Now Sound Blaster Live isn't my preferred choice, but it does make a lot of sense for a Windows 98 build. This just being a slightly older system, I, I really wanted an AW64 in there, it makes a lot of sense, but I was able to find drivers for this CT4870, so I was able to get it to working pretty much everywhere I wanted. Um, but this did have one slight issue. The CD connector for the audio, it's too close to the edge of the card. As I had to modify it so that the cable doesn't extend over the edge of the PCB at all. As we put this together, you'll see why. But with that modification here to connect to the laptop drive, this card works out pretty well. Unfortunately, this doesn't have an optical out, so there's no way of using the SPDIF connector for the CD interface, but that really doesn't matter. So I don't, I don't care. It works. And I'm, <laughs> to me, that's the best criteria to go with. Well, okay. It works and it fits, which let's go ahead and see how this fits in there up against the CD drive now. All right, slide the card in. There we go. And this time I'm going to try and do this from the back so I can see both sides. There we go. And as this whole front panel goes in, we can see it just barely clears it. There's only enough space for me to stick my finger there. So yes, that's pretty much the only card I could get to work in there. All right, now that we have the sound card in there, I'm gonna go ahead and run the CD audio cable, which comes off of the motherboard and then connects right here. And there we go. And then I usually just kind of tuck this down cause I gotta make room for the Voodoo 2, which is going in next. So let's get started on that. Man, I haven't really, there we go. Now the Voodoo 2 is not too bad to get in here. Um, as long as you just gotta get it under this bar and then slot it in. Now, both of these cards are not retained with a screw that holds them in over here. There is a little notch that you have to slide that part of the PCI connection or bracket over, there we go. That kind of holds them in place while you actually hold them in with this little bracket that wedges down there and then grabs down onto them because there is just no space in here for there to be screws. And that is how you hold the cards in. And we're getting really close to having all the pieces in here now. It's just space is starting to dry up. At this point, we can now install the front face. All right, now the next step is finishing up the front half of the computer that just moves entirely, which is hilarious. Now this is just a standard 1.4 megabyte uh, floppy drive. I suspect though, I could replace this with an LS120 drive. The problem is the button. Now this button, I actually 3D printed uh, because when I got this one, it was missing that one. The only reason I could see that it would be missing because you have to intentionally take off this front face plate is that it was set up at some point in being used and they didn't want uh, people to be able to put in a floppy disk and take it out. So they just pulled the eject button off and then you couldn't do that anymore. I could also see it just having been broken because I'll put a disk in there later. And you'll see that it sticks out a whole lot. You could easily shear it off, but I suspect it was removed instead. But the thing that we have to do first here is install a hard drive, which goes right here. Now, originally I was gonna try to use a 160 gig drive, but that didn't work out because of the BIOS problems. I even tried using the OnTrack disk manager solution. That did not work. So I ended up getting this 30 gigabyte Mac store drive to work, but I also used this SD card adapter. Now this SD card adapter was actually so difficult to get working that I had to desolder the four pin hard drive sized Molex connector because I came up with a really weird configuration. Now, both of these work and I decided I kind of want both in there, but I may change my mind later, I don't know. Hard drives actually generate a lot of heat and the only heat output on this whole computer, the only fan that does anything is this one for the power supply that has to exhaust through those little tiny holes. So I don't know, the fewer heat generating devices, the better, but for now I'm gonna go with a hard drive 
and the SD card adapter. But there's so little space in there, what has to happen is I have to put the SD card adapter in like this and then put the hard drive in on top of it. So yeah, the only way, the only reason I'm able to do this at all is because this is actually a low profile hard drive too. So uh, yeah, that's interesting. But I'm gonna go ahead and get that installed now. Now, before I put the SD card hard drive adapter thing in there, I'm actually going to attach the floppy power connector on this adapter cable. I actually kind of made this adapter cable too because I wanted a floppy power and a Molex splitter and a fan connector all in one. So I piggybacked the floppy connector uh, off of the pins going into there. So it's actually safe and there are no uh, bare connections exposed and I get everything I wanted. So this I will just slide in here and I have to kind of push up on that to get it to fit. And come on, there we go. <laughs> this ends up being one of the uh, tightest cable management areas of the whole system because we have to plug in a cable going in there, one here, one there, one there, and one there. And uh, well, you'll see, this is a whole problem area on this system. This case is so tight, I forgot to plug in the CPU fan here, so I had to pull out the Voodoo 2 and the Sound Blaster. Yeah, this thing just, it really, really sucks to work on. I hate it anytime I have to reopen this to do something, but there we go, I have this manually connected and this just spins at max speed all the time. Okay, now this next part, th it takes a lot of concentration to do, so I'm not gonna be talking while I do this. I'm just gonna fast forward through it. So I'm gonna tell you everything I'm gonna do here first. So the cards are currently out because I had to put the floppy cable back in, which goes there, of course, and I'm gonna have to put those back in first. Then as I slide the front face plate back in, I'm going to have to connect the IO interface for all the buttons and the LEDs and stuff. Then I'm gonna have to connect the IDE connector for the laptop drive. Then as this slides in, I'm going to have to plug the IDE cable in for the hard drive and the SD card. Then as that gets a little bit closer, I'm going to have to put in the power supply and then I can put the power supplies cable in, then I'll have to plug in the hard drive power to this one because the hard drive actually goes so far up against the power supply that it needs this really short Molex power connector instead of the other one because that's too long, but this isn't. That's how tight this case is. Then I'll have to plug in the floppy data, then floppy power, and just it's this whole thing. It all has to go in in this very particular order. So just sit back and enjoy this because it's a total nightmare. As a side note though, <clears throat> this is the original IDE cable for this system. It would just go right here to the hard drive right there. This is bad now because I've had to open this computer so many times, it does not work anymore. Uh, there's broken conductors in there. Instead, I'm using a full-sized IDE cable, but I'm connecting it really weird. I'm connecting in the middle, and then this one goes to the hard drive, and then this one's actually gonna wrap all the way around into a really weird configuration like that to plug into the SD card adapter, because this thing was not designed to have two IDE hard drives in here. It takes a really weird way of doing it, but that works. So this is gonna be, this takes a long time and is really cautious, but, all right, let's go ahead and do it. I'll just stop here to point out at this time, everything is actually connected, but the case still isn't closed yet. So I have to cable manage everything out of the way and then get the case tightened into place. All right, the case is tightened down. Now all the cables just have to go somewhere so that the lid can slide on. 
And there we go. Is that not the most nightmarish build you've ever seen as far as how compact everything has to be in there? Okay, there we go. That's, that's how this computer goes together. It is pretty ridiculous, but just look at how much functionality it has. It is insane, but there is, there is absolutely no wasted space. I mean, technically, yeah, right here, there could be more, but this card could also be longer and take up that space. So it's not like that's totally unaccounted for. I mean, sure. Yeah. You could put some right here. I do actually wonder if somehow there would be a sound card that would go there because there are these outputs right here for sound, but I don't see an unpopulated spot on the PCB for it. So there may have been a weird card, but this riser piece isn't standard and there's no way that you could just adapt a sound card to fit it. So I don't know, but geez, man, this thing's ridiculous. I really wanted the uh, Voodoo 2 right on top of the CPU instead of the sound blaster so it could share in the benefit of that fan. I am tempted to put a couple of blower fans right here that blow over the card. Uh, and I might do that in a future uh, update to this build, but for now, I'm not gonna worry about it. <laughs> it just really sucks that this is the only exhaust fan. Actually, it's the only intake fan as well. These holes, these slots right here in the front are the only air intake for this system, so. Yeah, this is, this is a really tight, probably inadvisable build, but the end result here is so sweet that I just can't pass up the opportunity. So yeah, I probably wouldn't recommend this build, but I'm definitely gonna enjoy every last bit of it while I can. But let's go ahead and get the last bit of the assembly done. There's a little lip here that you have to hook into the inside, and then you can just slide this in I'm gonna have to push these cables to where they need to be. And pull the case, massage it a little. There we go. That's got a Sound Blaster, a Voodoo 2, and a Pentium 233 MMX with a floppy drive and a CD drive in it. This wasn't my goal when I started building this system, but this might actually be the ultimate sleeper PC for this era because it's just so tiny and like absolute max spec. Now for me, being the ultimate sleeper PC really wasn't the objective. I'm actually a little tired of sleeper PCs because people have seen move lost the idea of what they really are. This genuinely is a sleeper PC because you would never expect a cash register computer to be a gaming PC, especially not of this caliber that is totally period accurate. But anyway, I digress. What I really wanted this computer for is its size. It's so small. I, like I said, am normally a fan of giant computers, so this is uncharted territory for me. So I ended up seeking out a complete assortment of peripherals for this that match its diminutive stature, starting with a monitor. This is a 10 inch color VGA CRT. That's so perfect for this build. Matter of fact, if I take the base of the monitor off, this whole computer with that display is less than 12 inches tall and will fit in an IKEA Calyx shelf. Another nice thing about this monitor is that it supports the pass-through video power connector on the power supply, so all I have to do is turn on the computer and it powers up the CRT as well. Now, since this is a Voodoo 2 setup and that card can only do 3D, the 2D card on the motherboard has to be passed through it to the display, which means that I'll need a patch cable to connect the motherboard to the GPU, and then I can connect the monitor to that. I'm connecting the monitor through a VGA splitter, so that's not the same cable going into it, but very coincidentally, the patch cable I have is actually the same plastic molding as this monitor's VGA cable, so when it's all put together, it looks so much more cohesive than I would have ever guessed it could. So that takes care of video, but what about the mouse and keyboard? Well, the mouse is going to be a Microsoft Wheel mouse, which is actually one of the smallest PS2 mice I've run across. And the keyboard is, well, it's some random mushy, tiny point of sale keyboard that I found at the thrift store. I'm really not happy with it and I have my eye on a replacement, but for the time being, it's very small. And lastly, no gaming computer would be complete without sound. 
but speakers were actually the most difficult thing for me to find. So many of them focused on being huge to provide better sound that it was actually quite challenging to find some that were small, even not great and small. I almost went with this pair of Sound Blaster speakers because they're definitely fun, but they're so large they really steal your attention and make the whole system seem a bit too multimedia focused to me. But thankfully, at the final hour, I found the perfect speakers. Ones that I actually already had. This pair of Cambridge Soundwork speakers. These actually sound fantastic and were my first choice, but I was missing the stands for them on my original set, but they kind of just look weird sitting flat on the desk. The only thing about these, though, is that they cheat. These are just passive speakers. They don't have any power going to them at all, and they aren't powered by the sound card itself. Instead, they use a giant subwoofer tucked away under the desk for power. This ends up making them sound way better than they should for their size, and honestly, it's kind of perfect for this computer, because this whole thing is about having way too much power hidden away, so I kind of love this pairing. And with the addition of the speakers, I call this computer complete. So let's fire it up for the first time. Definitely not like the... 30th time because I've been testing it for the last two weeks. Yeah, that's right. And there we go, booted up and running Windows 98 SE. Now, I don't really want to go through the installation process on this again on camera. There's nothing that particularly special about it. It's just that I've done it like seven times now between troubleshooting all of the drive and configuration issues. So I've just seen it enough on this system. There are a few things to note about installing it on here though. Despite the BIOS having an option to boot from the CD, it absolutely will not for me, and I have to use a floppy disk to do it. But other than that non-issue, there weren't any problems with setting up Windows 98 on this system. It was blissfully easy, actually, because it had drivers for all of the onboard peripherals, so I didn't have to hunt down anything, with the potential future exception of the network adapter, which I haven't been able to get to work and had it take down the whole computer with a Windows protection error, but... I don't need LAN because this has USB, which does install and work fine on here, but to get a flash drive working, I did have to install the Windows 98 USB mass storage driver, which not a problem at all, fits on a floppy disk, and then makes your life so much easier by being able to use flash drives to transfer over data. Now one of the only other quirks I've had with this computer is the monitor here, which did not come with the computer again. Um, this monitor is very clearly uh, not designed for any resolution other than 640 by 480. If I apply an 800 by 600 here, the whole thing gets super dark because the beam isn't changing intensity for the longer sweeps that it's having to do with more image data. Um, and other resolutions beyond 640 by 480 and 800 by 600, it does not like. <laughs> so uh, I just don't even use those. What sucks is that it happens for other lower resolutions too, like 512 by 384 on Half-Life here, it is not getting proper horizontal sync and it is making an audible high-pitched noise. So yeah, all of that though is because this is a dumb analog monitor. There is no display circuitry in there, really. Uh, the settings are all adjusted with knobs on the bottom, brightness, contrast, all that good stuff. So. Really, there's nothing in here presenting an EID um, for the operating system to check what resolutions it can support or 
anything. <laughs> so yeah, it has no built-in protection and it will happily run anything you send at it to its own demise. Now I did have to manually install the Voodoo 2 and Sound Blaster Live on here, which was very easy actually. Uh, for the Voodoo 2, you just go into the device manager and then manually update the driver, selecting the one you wanted. I actually went with the, oh, I have my color settings wrong. I went with the standard Voodoo driver. I think it's uh, 3.02 instead of the fast Voodoo driver, just because I like the splash screen better. Uh, and, <laughs> And for the Sound Blaster, instead of going that route, um, I actually found some drivers and did the install by going into the uh, audio drivers, uh, Windows 98 folder thing. And I ran the setup here and selected the VXD drivers. Now, there's some pros and cons to this. Um, the pros are games work. <laughs> um, I had some massive issues with driver and the uh, WDM drivers, um, which took a while to figure out and another reinstall of Windows 98. But after getting those set up, this is now a fantastic gaming computer. And I'm not kidding. Matter of fact, let's take a look at a few games on here and just why this particular combination of processor and video card is so good. Now to say that this system supports a lot of games really feels like underselling it to me. It's actually kind of staggering how many games looking through my collection, not that seriously, have a minimum system requirement of a Pentium 200 or 233 with a 3D accelerator card. This is very much a winning combination for this time period. There were even updates made available for originally software-only 3D games to let them use actual 3D accelerator hardware. Although there wasn't really a consensus on how to handle this from a consumer standpoint, so sometimes you'd get free updates like GL Quake, and other times you might have to buy an expansion or re-release of a game like Interstate 76's Nitro Pack. And in some cases this could mean that you had to rebuy the whole game all over again just to get support for the hardware you now have. And even sometimes updates or re-releases would need just a little bit more powerful hardware, like with Unreal here, where original Unreal runs fine on this computer, but Unreal Gold just doesn't work well. But a lot of my personally favorite games run great on here, and I have other computers for the ones that don't run well. So to me, this system is a fun little historical piece for the first generation of 3D hardware and software. Plus, you can always go older for more games. Anything a 4D6 can run, this can run just fine. But now let's actually try out a game. So we're going to install Turok. Because how could we not try a game that tells you right on the front of the box that it requires a 3D accelerator card? Now the bulk of the install process for Torok really isn't all that different than any normal game. The only real difference that happens for a game from this era is when you go to launch it. You need to configure it for the API that makes the most sense for your graphics card. And sometimes you even need to choose your graphics card. All right, so we can go up to video and we can select a different display driver that we want. Now I'm going to go ahead and use the 3DFX custom driver. Now this is actually going to be the Glide API that 3DFX created for their Voodoo cards. It uses a subset of OpenGL commands. But if we wanted to, we could also run some direct 3D versions. There may actually be performance differences between the two, but I haven't really tried them and I tend to use the 3DFX driver. And honestly, that is reason enough to use the 3DFX driver. And there we go. This really is a great game for this system. This runs incredibly well while still providing a very immersive 3D experience and it just works. Yeah, I know I missed the pistol. This is a game that I originally played on the Nintendo 64, which is probably its best known platform. I'm sure some of you are watching this and thinking, I didn't even know that was on PC. But this is easily the definitive version for the era. It runs fantastic and looks great. Now, some of you may not have experienced software 3D, so let's install Quake and try out the original version of Quake on this machine 
without having GL Quake installed yet. All right, so here's what the original version of Quake looked like. You could change the resolution, but the options were mm, not great, and none of them were particularly high resolution. But if we switch to GL Quake, you have a very different experience. The video options for this are much more interesting. <laughs> It'll go up really, really high for this system. But this is very much a better experience than software 3D can give you. And oh man, does Quake run smooth. But that's to be expected since it's not really a, a, a new game for this computer. Pod is another example of a game like Quake that received a 3FX patch after it was first released. Thankfully, the version on the left here is one of the releases that actually supports 3DFX stuff. Though in order to get it working, I did still have to patch it because Pod is uh, really, really difficult to get 3DFX running correctly on. Oh, yeah, that, that sound always brings me back, man. That sound has definitely been my text message notification sound in the past. Oh, you, you really don't know how, how nice it is to have this game be running in full normal 3D effects mode. For me, I, I've been trying to do this for so long. Oh. And it runs so well. Okay, now there's one more game that I want to check out before we end this because this is getting a bit long now, and that's Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, only because I had a rather unusual experience with it. When I first launched the game, it ran like garbage, despite the system requirements being easily met by this computer. It turns out that this game has an external GPU selection tool that allows you to choose which 3D card you run the game on and it just so happened to default to the S3 card, because again, that is technically 3D capable. It is just terrible at it. And when I set it to the Voodoo 2, the game ran great from there, which was quite a relief because I actually want to play this game again now. But I should really cut it off there because I could seriously keep going on about how many games I love that run on this computer because this is my favorite era of PC games. There's just so many great games that run on this thing, and I've been playing a bunch already <laughs> as I've been testing this computer. And I have tried to thoroughly test it. I think that it's not going to have any overheating issues despite the problems I mentioned earlier. I've let it run for a few hours with some intense CPU and GPU based games and didn't really run into any issues. So I would say that this is probably going to be a fairly stable build from here on out. Which is really surprising for just how small and compact everything is in there. And just again, this thing is tiny. Here it is next to a 120 millimeter fan. <laughs> That's just hilarious. Now, along with it being small, the 640x480 resolution might seem a bit restrictive to some people, but if I put the whole computer next to a 24-inch 1080p monitor, you can again see that it is just tiny, but the white square in the center of the monitor there is a 1 to 1 640x480 image, and you can see that it's almost the same size as the CRT's display. So really, the CRT's DPI is pretty good at 640x480. Now, interestingly, you could probably build a smaller computer if you started with an SBC or PC-104 stuff, but I don't think you would end up with as nice of a packaged product as this. For a complete computer system, I really think that this might be about as small as you can go. But that's not the most important thing to me. The most important thing is that it's a lot of fun to play with, and I'm really enjoying it. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to subscribe because I'll have more like it in the future. And if you want to support this channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, I hope you guys enjoyed this look at the smallest Pentium computer I can imagine, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>